right, so welcome to Removing Barriers to Digital Transformation. My name is Lucian Fogoros. I'm the co-founder of IoT World, and I want to thank the speakers, the attendees, yourself, for being here, uh, the sponsor of this session, Schneider Electric, for making it possible. So please take a look in the Q&A. That's where you post a question for each panelist. Uh, uh, we're going to be focusing on removing barriers to digital transformation. So today's industrial enterprises are facing unprecedented challenges, including economic and geopolitical uncertainties, rapid changes in demand, the raw material and energy pricing, continued pressure to reduce cost, increased need to environmental sustainability, increased product variants and shorter life cycles, workforce uh, gen generational turnover. So to address these challenges, the industrial market is in undergoing an enormous digital transformation with industrial automation as a key enabler. But we're not there yet. So let's talk about what is holding us back from the full digital transformation uh, the industry needs. So we've heard a little bit about yesterday about the human transformation uh, aspect uh, through the keynote that Dr. Guido did. And, and today um, we're, we're gonna, on and off, we're gonna have several aspects that, that touches on the people as well as uh, 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 technology and processes. So I've invited a few, a few folks. So um, um, from uh, Wood Corporation, we have Bridget Fitzpatrick, a process authority uh, 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 figure. So uh, Bridget, welcome. Uh, give us a few words about yourself and why should the audience care? All righty. Um, so as you said, I'm with Wood. I'm uh, the global technical lead for process automation systems. And I kind of have an interesting background where I started out life on the process engineering side and then moved over into control to do interesting things that the control engineers wouldn't do for me. So I'm very interested in driving benefits to the bottom line and using technology to do that. And I really think that we're on the cusp of some really interesting things. So happy to be here and talk about it. Thank you, Bridget. And, and I know you're quite active in the ISA. I talked to a number of uh, board members. So thank you for joining. Uh, uh, Franco Cavadini, uh, R&D Program Manager with Senesis, welcome. Give us a few uh, words by yourself. Uh, first of all, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, as Senesis, uh, we are a small company located in Italy, but we have the privilege to work in between uh, research and development and the industry. And most often, we support companies in accepting new technologies such as those we will discuss today. So let's say that I have a, a very peculiar point of view on this uh, digital transformation we are actually facing in the industry. And I hope that uh, I will be able to provide some useful insights to our participants today. Thank you, Franco. Uh, so it looks like we got North America, we got Europe. So from Europe also joining us, John Conaway, uh, which is uh, the Director for Industrial Automation Incubator. Looking forward to learn more about that. Ash Hyde Electric, also the sponsor of this session. Welcome, John. Yeah, hi, Lucian. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, John Conway, Schneider Electric. Um, we make uh, everything from push buttons to shutdown systems for power stations, for nuclear power stations. I work inside the in a software incubator. We're designing our next generation uh, automation systems. Uh, and part of, this, part of the spec is to solve some of the IIoT use cases. So we'll be talking a little bit more about about that this morning and this afternoon. Great, thank you, John. And also from uh, Wood Corporation, we got Jeffrey Shannon, the Director of Intelligent Operations. Welcome, Jeff. Um, thank you very much. So um, I'm Jeff Shannon. I'm a director in our automation and control business for intelligent operations. I've been working in automating plants, facilities, processes for the past 25 years and uh, largely been working on our open process automation effort and um, and helping customers use their data to drive value in the organization. Thank you, Jeff. So if you see, we have a, a whole range of, of perspective, different uh, geographical areas, but more important vendors perspective as well as uh, consultants uh, and, and, and so on. So my first question uh, to the panel is, are today's automation system, whether we talk about PLCs or DCSs, up to the digital transformation challenge. So maybe we'll start with John at Schneider Electric as a vendor of both. What do you say? Um, well, sure. If we, if we look at what an automation system does, you know, if I take a Modicon PLC or, or a Foxboro DCS system, 
they're really good at real-time deterministic control. They've been doing that for 30, 40 years. It's their, it's, it's the core, it's their core function. Uh, they're great at it. Our competitors are also have great products that do the same thing. They're perfect for real-time deterministic control. But if we look at the digital transformation, I mean, if I think about the digital transformation, what I think about is um, different systems that have to operate together seamlessly to solve a complex use case that one system on its own can't solve. That, that's kind of how I see a digital transformation. And, and the automation systems of today, are really they're closed, they're proprietary, and they don't really, um, they're not good at, at interfacing to other systems. So, so they're missing some essential ingredients, you know, that the IT, the IT world takes for granted, like object orientation, decoupling of software and hardware, et cetera, et cetera. These things are missing and, we, and, and the next generation automation systems have to do a better job of addressing this if they're gonna be part of the, of the uh, digital transformation. Thank you, John, for the insight. And I spent uh, 20 years in industrial automation, mostly in the open space, so PC-based controls. So I'm looking forward to, to, to dive deeper into that. I'm gonna switch over to Franco real quick. Tenesis uh, has been doing some advanced work. Uh, what do you think? Well, uh, having uh, both the perspective of the research and that of the industry, uh, I cannot but agree with, uh, with what John said. If we look at traditional automation, uh, PLCs and DCS, from the perspective of uh, the reason they were created for, which is real-time control, obviously they, up, they are up to the, to the challenge. But the problem is that uh, the transition to digital means that the controllers must become something more they are the gateway between the physical and the digital world. And if you look at the type of requirement that comes out from this new situation, then unfortunately, current automation solutions are absolutely not uh, up to the, to the game. Um, let me also state something which might be a bit uh, uh, unheard of, or at least uh, a bit collateral to this, but uh, equally important. Uh, there is a, a methodological and cultural gap also linked to this. Uh, today, if you look at the youngest, most of it, uh, the job of the PLC programmer or the DCS programmer is, is not attractive. We have a lot of people coming out from colleges, from universities, that doesn't look into the industry as an attractive job. Now, the potential to change is there because digitalization brings uh, uh, cool keywords into, our, into automation, like artificial intelligence, predictive maintenance, uh, uh, data analytics and so on. But in order to be ready to accept this new generation of workers, we need to substitute the key technological elements sustaining it. And so we need to change uh, the way automation is currently conceived and done. Thank you, uh, Franco, for those insights. And do you agree, do you disagree? Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A in the audience and we'll take them uh, in the order that, uh, that they come in. So Bridget, as a global EPC, uh, engineering procurement construction, do you see innovation being limited? I think that it historically has been somewhat limited just because it was somewhat difficult to do. So, you know, in a 30 year career, innovation's always been there and sophisticated controls that go back to first principles have always been there. But we really only did them when there was a significant amount of pain or a significant opportunity. And one of the things that tended to happen was because there was so much pain, it kind of became a mysterious black box that people were afraid to touch. So I, you know, I definitely have, you know, stories to tell of systems that got put into place and then the whole platform and the system wasn't touched for 20 years because everyone was afraid of it. Um, and to Franco's point, um, to make this whole industry attractive to the next generation, instead of a few people getting to do the cool, fancy, innovative stuff, we need to enable it. So that's what we all do. Um, so I really think that, that where we're going is important. Thank you, Bridget. And Jeffrey, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so digital transformation holds great promise for basically process plants and manufacturing in general. Um, we're all trying to look at techniques such, such as artificial intelligence and machine learning to gain those big step changes in that. And what many facilities have is a lot of disparate 
technology and systems that are not interconnected in any way. Um, interoperability was not inherent in the design because most of the applications are more of a tool than a platform uh, with that. So to get to the point of predicting equipment failure in the future based on past process data um, for optimizing um, for spot prices on materials, energy costs, things like that are quite difficult to do. And to really realize true production planning and scheduling with some of that integrated from a data perspective um, has its difficulties. Probably 75 to 80 percent of the time is my estimate on the time spent on trying to pull together the data to get to the point of analyzing it. Um, you know, that is not the value add step. Uh, it's an unfortunate side effect of, of, of the state of technology in, in, in many facilities. Got it. Now, John, I'm going to turn it back to you. And, and do you see the same uh, thing as the end user needs? You're on mute, John, by the way. I'm on mute. Sorry about that. Yes, yes. I mean, examples of that in the in the market. Take the Open Process Automation Forum, OPAF. It's a, it's a it's a it's a group of of users and suppliers that have come together to create a a standards based uh, open automation platform. So essentially, they're taking existing standards like OPC UA like IEC 61499, and they're putting these standards together to create a standard of standards. But fundamentally what they want are open process automation systems that give you essentially interoperability across different platforms, and it also allow them to um, have portable application software from one vendor platform to another. So that, that's just one example of, 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 of what we see in, 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 in the market of, of people wanting things to change. Yeah? Sure. Now, I'm, I'm a huge believer of polling the audience, of crowdsourcing the question. So for that, we like to take a quick poll on, on the uh, what is the ideal system look like? And, and if, I'd like to ask the audience, as, as you see on a screen, there'll be a poll and, and, and it's, it's multiple choices. So please select as, as many as you like uh, and there and panelists are welcome to vote as well. So here we go. Uh, so what would be the ideal automation system. So please rank this in the uh, order of importance. Give it a few moments. Hopefully you're, uh, there you go, and start doing that. Just uh, not at 20 seconds or so. Okay, another 10 seconds and then we'll, uh, we'll display the results and uh, we'd like to maybe uh, just kind of uh, have the panelists kind of uh, talk about what the audience think about this. And so here we go and, and share results. So uh, anybody wants to comment on this? Uh, um. It's pretty evenly spread, right? Um, but actually, I'm so the one that seems to be on the top. The combination of real-time control and right-time functions as part of an application—that's interesting. I wasn't thinking that was going to come on top. I was thinking maybe would, would people would want to separate those two rather than put them together. So that's 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 very interesting. So from your perspective, John, maybe I'll go back to you and and, and what, in your opinion, what is the ideal system look like? And we'll go around round robin. Oh, oh, there's lots of um, lots lots of lots of um, it's a, that's a that's a long question. But if I look at these the questions we asked here, I look at the last one, which actually only got 38% response, which is interesting. But the, there is a reality out there, which is that there's a lot of installed automation systems out there that aren't going away. Uh, so any future automation system has to be able to really be able to not rip and replace those new ones that's Schneider Electric Stream right let's rip all those competitive systems out and put Schneider systems in there but that's not that's not real that's not reality so a new the new generate next generation systems have to be able to easily wrap those existing legacy systems so that they can be brought forward into into the future and, and reused uh, over for, you know for as long as possible that's that's the reality of our business huh? thank you John anybody else want to comment on that 
Franco? Uh, yes, Lucien, I would like to add something which uh, might be a bit uh, of a different perspective. Uh, usually we tend to talk uh, mostly about uh, uh, how the system works, uh, the runtime phase, uh, I mean, how all things are managing communication data, everything in our, let's say, domain of the industrial internet of things is focused on this. But one of the biggest pain that uh, companies are actually facing in, in, in this transition into Industry 4.0 is that uh, the effort needed to develop uh, advanced solutions, these digital solutions, integrated with automation, is most of the time too high to justify starting it. So I have seen in one of the, in the Q&A, that some of them, have, uh, some of the participants to the, to the talk, to the panel, has asked which are the biggest pains. Well, this one is, is, is a pain, the, the effort needed to develop a digitalization solutions, which I think is most of the time underestimated. Uh, what we are saying here is not that with current automation, all of these things uh, cannot be done at all. What we are saying is that it's so effort intense to develop very advanced digital solutions that most of the time they are not actually tackled. So if I look at what a solution, an ideal solution would need, is the right balance between advanced runtime features, like combining real time and any time features, but also the right engineering tools. This is what is actually missing. And it's coherent with what Bridget was saying before about uh, bringing uh, the access to these uh, advanced uh, uh, developments, not just to experts, uh, not just to the R&D, but to the everyday engineer. This is the biggest challenge here, I think. Yeah, thank you, Franco. And I think that leads me to, uh, uh, to another question. Uh, you know, it's an impressive list, but what are we going to, to design, build such a system? So if anybody wants to take that. Uh, what do we need to design build such a system, uh, Lucian? Was that the question? Yes. How are we going to design build such a system? Okay. Um, well, there is some good news is we don't start from scratch, okay? Um, um, maybe you could, um, I want to talk about a, there's a standard, it's the IEC 64099 standards, not, not so well known in the industry, but it's been around for a few years. If you could, if you could um, pop up, there you go, slide number one. And I'll try and explain in, in, in two minutes, IEC 61499. Um, basically, the, first of all, the people that created this standard are the same people that created the IEC 61131 standard. Uh, however, what, the 1131 was more about uh, PLC programming languages. 1499 is about, it's a, a graphical modeling language for distributed control and information systems. But it's actually, fundamentally different from 1131, but actually also very complementary because it doesn't actually define the programming language. Um, and what it, I think that I'll mention two things that, I've, that 4099 does. Number one is it, it, they, they took this digital function block, which uh, PLC programs will, will, will be familiar with. And on, on the inputs, they added event inputs to data inputs, and they have added event outputs to data outputs. And then inside, it's like a black box. I program it in whatever programming language I like. In theory, there's no, there's no limit. Um, but what I've done here, I've created essentially a, an object, a software component, a black box, and I can nest, I can nest one inside the other. So I've created this, this, this object, which an IT guy, he'll see this and he can understand this. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing that the um, standard does, which is very, very powerful, is it separates the application model from the underlying system devices. So it decouples the software application uh, from the underlying hardware. And again, that's very important because essentially now I can design applications and I can port them across different platforms. So it's, it's this combination of um, black box, uh, software components, event-driven function blocks, combined with this ability to essentially decouple software and hardware. This kind of enables a, a, a world of portable software. I can imagine instead of programming applications, I will download software components from, 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 from software companies, from, from automation vendors, from mechanical equipment vendors. I'll download their components. I'll link them together into an applications and deploy them to 
to different uh, different vendor hardwares. Okay, so it's this what you know I like to call this plug and produce. I plug and produce. I plug together components and start producing very quickly, and get rid of a bunch of um, proprietary proprietary programming. And and forty ninety nine six forty ninety nine gives you a technical foundation to to realize that. Thank you, John. I appreciate uh, bringing back my early back in my career when I started with the IEC 61131. Uh, so I assume that's from the same organization, PLC Open, that's what you're referring to, right? Well, PLC Open, they represent the 1131. Yeah. Um, but the actual standard itself is for its IEC. It's 11, you have the 61131 and the 64099. Got it. Uh, any, any other comments before I want to go back to another poll, but any, Franco, anybody else want to comment on this? Well, I would like to commend the fact that uh, uh, some of the things we are discussing are in the future, but some of them are in the present. Uh, together with the John, uh, the team from Schneider, but also other companies, especially here in Europe, uh, we have started working on this approach uh, uh, quite a few years ago, and now we are uh, finally seeing the results of what we have been doing. In particular, I would like to bring to the table a couple of concrete examples that we have been working on during the, the past few years. So the one you are showing now on the slide is, uh, is actually applied to the process industry. Uh, we have the chance to, to develop a pilot plant for a quite revolutionary process to, uh, to chemically recycle uh, plastics. Uh, the pilot plant for this uh, process, which you see here, our uh, graphic I represented, is gonna come online at the end of this year. And actually, we are building the automation part of this plant, uh, all based on the concepts that uh, John just briefly introduced uh, a few seconds ago. So based on a solution, a reference implementation of the 61499 standard. And uh, if you please go to the, to the following slide, uh, what we will see in this, uh, sorry, again, next slide. So why? Have we chosen to go in this direction for this pilot plant? Well, the intrinsic nature of the process is modular. There are uh, several number of machines working in parallel to, to actually implement the process. And so we needed to have a flexible enough uh, automation solutions to manage, uh, let's say, object-oriented development of uh, automation code, but also to manage flexibility to production, which uh, is intrinsic in, the, in this process. And so let's say that in a few months from now, we will be able to, uh, to, to have a running a uh, physical plant uh, where this technology can be uh, actually uh, touched and felt uh, in, in concrete uh, under the constraints of a, of a typical uh, industrial uh, plant. Thank you uh, uh, for that, Franco. Let me stop share real quick and we'll move over to just a uh, uh, yet one other poll. And uh, that is more on the um, uh, most important IoT use cases that an open interoperable automation system would allow you to achieve. So please just select one for this and we got 30 seconds more for this. So just select one of those options. It's not multiple, it's just one option. All right, so we'll uh, give it another five seconds. Uh, All right, so the numbers are stopping now. Just a couple of more seconds. I see there's still 80 out of 160. There we go. Okay, uh, I'm gonna end the polling right now and uh, display the results and maybe reach out to Jeffrey and Bridget. Uh, do you wanna comment? So if I guess I'm not terribly surprised that the, the top billing there is around remote operations, autonomous operations types of things. That's certainly something that um, we've seen growing over the years and definitely kind of going vertical in the interest in the, in the whole COVID world. So, so definitely something that, that we're focused on. So, so not too surprised to see that. Um, and, you know, certainly playing the business cases of digitalization into reduced downtime and maintenance optimization is also um, something that that we see a lot as well. Got it. Anybody else want to jump in? Yeah. So um, 
the cost of adding those valuable instruments to equipment that is going to give you a lot of value in predictive uh, failure applications of, uh, of that equipment and things like that is fairly on the instrument side can be fairly costly and prohibitive when you need to do some of that in mass. And um, that's part of the basically remote monitoring of, of, of that equipment as well. So, you know, having that, that open, open solution and open technology is going to get that cost point down uh, significantly. Thank you, Jeffy. I'm going to stop the results and maybe maybe just a, 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 a closing question before we go to the Q&A. So if you had this ideal automation system, what would change? What would be the new world? What would it look like? Anybody wants to jump in? So one uh, thing that, that I, oh, go ahead, go ahead I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so one thing that, that I think that, you know, I would like to see achieved in, in industry in general is that I, I want to grab the best controls engineer and go uh, in, 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 and get those improvements that I need from a process perspective in a facility and not have them tied down by they don't know the proprietary technology in that, in that facility and it limits their ability to do work. Then requirements end up being let's say translated into someone who is a uh, implementation expert in the technology, but doesn't understand the control problem very well. And so there's a lot, of, a lot lost in, in that effort where a standards open and inter interoperable system is going to really change that dynamic. Got it. Bridget, you wanted to add something to that? I think that one of the things that I would most like to see is just having the systems flexibly integrate up into the business layers so that we really can do real-time business control. Um, part of this probably comes from my background. So one of the first fancy projects that I did, um, I actually took real-time power pricing off the Texas grid and real-time natural gas pricing and ran it into a, a utilities optimizer and then a real-time optimizer that manage the marginal utility cross costs across like four APC controllers. So we're running the whole plant and it was vastly painful and, and took months to do. And as we were getting ready to turn it on, I enabled the, the real time power pricing to page me if it got high. So it normally was about $30 a megawatt hours. And three days after I turned on the pager alert, it went to a thousand dollars and there'd been a brownout in Houston, and I kind of did some looking and decided it was gonna last for a couple days. So I went and talked to the plant manager and we elected to shut down some plastics operations in the plant. And in three days, we made a million dollars selling power into the grid because there was a brownout in Houston. So to me, that definitely changed my perspective on how important or how valuable it could be to, to respond to things on business terms. Thank you, Bridget. Great insights. Uh, John or Franco, you want to add to that? Um, well, just one comment. I think I think we need to move from the auto, the automation business is a hardware centric business today. We sell hardware, uh, and we're definitely moving to a software centric business model. We, you know, IoT is not about hardware; it's about software. So, and automation systems need to become will become software centric. Uh, and they have to be open and not proprietary so that the IoT guys can, you know, easily interface to that thing called a PLC sitting over there in the corner on a machine and not have, and not have to scratch their heads and, and, and not touch the thing for 30 years. That, that really has to change and that, that will change. Got it. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, great insights there. And, and, and like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm keen about seeing what the audience what questions they have always, uh, like to crowdsource those questions. So we've covered a lot of ground. So let's turn over to see some of the questions from the audience. I know I have certainly my own, a couple of more questions, but um, let me uh, switch over to, um, I saw one on ROI and I'll bring over also Greg Orloff on my team to kind of monitor those. But there was one question, if you could describe more to, to the pain points with current system and what you view system that need to uh, be in the future. That's actually from, Siri de la Lange. Anybody wants to jump in on that? 
Uh, yes, Lucian, uh, since I partially touched the, the point, I will start trying to provide an answer because, uh, I mean, we should have hours to really answer this, this one. But uh, um, I think that uh, I, I will try to provide an example. Now, I'm, I'm working currently with, with a company uh, in, in the industrial sector. And I received uh, a, as a requirement uh, to develop all the control in ladder. Now, I would kindly ask, uh, how do we intend to add uh, predictive maintenance, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, advanced servitization of machines, uh, software-oriented business models, uh, by starting with a program which is written in ladder? So today, the biggest pain is that uh, we are trying to revolutionize the world of automation, but uh, we use tools that were conceived to do something else. And that something else was strict real-time control. And that, that's it. So the biggest pain today is uh, merging the original requirements of real-time automation with those coming from a new generation of control software. And this requires some uh, paradigmatic shift in the way we conceive automation and then in the tools we use to implement it. Got it. Thank you, Franco, for that. Uh, now, one question that I had, maybe perhaps uh, reach out to John again. Uh, and, uh, so obviously, you touched on the PLC standard, uh, the programming language, the IC61131. Why would I need 62? 6149, maybe just expand a little more there, a little more clarity. Um, well, I think, um, first of all, first of all, I don't oppose 4099 against 1131. I see them as complementary as an extension. And in simple terms, I think 64099 just brings some simple extensions that we need uh, to better interface the real time control world with the, you know, the, what Franco, I think, described as the right time. Um, I, IOT world, okay? You know, object, it brings object orientation, hardware, software decoupling, the event, it's event driven, which, which is important for your interface to transactional based systems. So, so it's, it's, it's an extension that brings things that we need, you know, and it exists. Um, it really, for me, sits between the OT and the IT world and uh, an IT guy, he sees it, he sees objects, event driven, he recognizes it, he can relate to it. An automation guy looks at it, he sees graphical function blocks and he can relate to it. So it's really a technology that, that sits between the two uh, and that is, the, is a, a natural extension and for me really the right solution for the for future next generation automation systems. Um, so yeah, I don't, oppose, I don't oppose the two. Uh, for me, it's just a natural extension uh, and it's the next, the next natural step. Maybe one more question I got to hear, John. So it's about more on the... Apologize. Uh, on the ROI, uh, apologize for the background noise there. And I've lost the question. Here we go. Um, so how, how fast we can show the ROI to customer if they want to transform their automation to digital and how long can they benefit and get the benefits to enable them to invest initially? Anybody wants to jump in on that? On the ROI portion of it? I know it's, it's a generic question. It's hard to put things by maybe uh, Give an example of uh, any of the folks that had implemented pro uh, uh, pro Sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things really, one of the biggest cost savings ends up being enabling you to get out of the rip and replace world. And the, the function block wrapper that is 61499 enables you to put your own IP into your solutions with a nice wrapper and it's very modular to to kind of echo some of what Franco talked about. So, for instance, when we worked on the Exxon Mobil OPA project, that project was four trains of, of operation. And we basically built one train with kind of generic naming. And then, you know, once we had that the way we liked it, you know, seriously, in like 15 minutes, we were able to then do the the graphical connection of the IO into the four trains and we were done. So it was, you know, it's a dramatic reduction in the engineering and an ability to um, encapsulate your own IP, but also just the, some of the design extensions that are part of the 61499 
allow you to do modularization and sophisticated templating in a way that that really takes a lot of the general engineering out of the out of the cost basis. Thank you, Bridget. And I know there's, a, there's several questions in the Q and A. Uh, one I'm going to go over to Admajo, and he says, "I'm curious about the status of open standards which seek to break the legacy of closed platforms such as uh, Open Architecture, OPATH, and MTP. In what stage?" Uh, are these standards now? Are they competitors or complementary? How many have adopted or are interested to adopt these standards, hardware, OEM providers, and end users? Who wants to take that? You know, I think in general, the the initiatives really are complementary, and there's definitely liaisons between the different groups to make sure that we stay um, current and you know, not to be too corny, but that we are interoperable amongst all the standards with what we're doing. Um, and, you know, to a large extent, we're taking standard protocols that are out there and, you know, the 1131 and the 1499 and um, just threading them through all of these standards. Thank you, Bridget. And now, uh, Pravin Singh has a question about how would you convince a giant like a typical oil and gas to give up already set up an efficient system and go digital transformation. And maybe I'll extend that, not just for large giants. How do you get started? I, I like to say small to mid How do you even convince the people to go on this journey? Yep. So economically, you know, from an ROI perspective, some of these operators are looking at, um, let's say billions of dollars in technology migration for existing assets they're gonna to have to do that on paper, aren't necessarily going to show a whole lot of return on investment. It's the guarantee to keep operating. And do you wanna to have to spend that kind of money again in 20 years, or do you wanna get where the hardware is becoming more the commodity and it's basically a standard you know, procurement purchasing for the, for the best IO I need at the time, just to replace the device and my software is intact. Uh, that's going to get. That's really going to be where the ROI is. Uh, it from from my view. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Now uh, I'm going to switch over. This is an anonymous anonymous question. So for those companies that can't afford an end-to-end -end IoT transformation, could an option be to turn to an OEM smart supply to leverage the insight supply by them? Any anybody wants to add to that? Well, I, I might try this one. Uh, obviously, the, the, the answer is, is difficult, especially for small and medium enterprises. The transition is going to be a challenge because usually they don't have the economic resources to face, uh, a, let's say, a, a full transformation immediately. Um, certainly, uh, we must envision by providing on the market new uh, automation platform sort of a, a transitionary path we cannot assume that one day from the other, just by switching a plug, uh, we, we can transform existing installed hardware. We need to be, to be certain that what we propose on the market is uh, both uh, completely innovative, but also having a look at the uh, in progressive integration of legacy system. Uh, I think John uh, previously mentioned the idea of this wrapping. So uh, what, we are, what we are proposing in digital transformation is a new level of intelligence into plants. And usually this is not, uh, let's say, fully uh, in contrast with existing automation. It means that we can provide solutions that can wrap existing automation and sort of upgrade the corresponding functionalities. Obviously, it's not going to be the ideal solution because the ideal solution would be to, to come and substitute everything. But at least it's... Uh, it's a, a, a right uh, trade-off uh, between the cost uh, and the, the features you get uh, that might become and might be able to, uh, to be accessible also by, by SMEs. Thank you, Franco. Now, I'm going to take another question that uh, may be going across. So we've been talking about interoperability between control system for 25 plus years. So it, to some extent, what was behind IC 61131 to succeed it requires to support and buy in from all major vendors. This did not happen before, so why should it happen now? What changes? The question from the audience. It's an anonymous question, so uh, but I, 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 I thought I'd throw a provocative uh, uh, one there. Wait, so, so, yeah, so let me, the, let me, yes, go ahead, go ahead, go, go ahead, John. Ahead, yeah. Well, I was going to say that you know, in the proprietary world. 
every other value add application that's not from that available from that supplier is a bolt on that's going to have um, its own implementation. It's going to be unique um, and, and outside of that normal product stream where uh, open solutions are offering a standard way of doing most everything from a software perspective in the real time world. And that's an enormous difference between um, having another, let's say, unelegant bolt on with protocols that has to be managed and it's going to be another unique application that the plant has to deal with. Thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Uh, John, you want to comment? Well, yeah, my only comment is, I mean, um, I think automation vendors have to pay attention to what's happening in the marketplace, okay? And if we don't pay attention, then we're, you know, potentially uh, automation vendors may get marginalized, okay? That's not the case of Schneider. We've always been very open. Um, we see the IEC, the IEC 64099 technology as being great technology that it's in the industry's interest to, to adopt. Uh, so that's our position. That's a, it's a, it's a promising technology that we are, that we are very, very, you know, very excited about her. And another question since I got to there says, uh, do you see a functional safety SIL rated control loops requirement adopting the digital transformation and will it influence the standard or the other way around? Or, or anybody wants to jump in on the functional safety? It's uh, from Mohammed Raza. We can get back on that. By the way, we do track those uh, questions and uh, we'll, we'll uh, leverage in the hashtag IOT World Days. We'll either answer via the social channels or through a blog uh, post. So we'll take that offline. Um, and let's see. Um, there was. Uh, I, I think I can comment on that briefly. Sure. Go ahead, Bridget. You know, I think really the first wave of, of innovation on the digital front is really going to be more on the process side than the safety side. So I think that you know it'll um, definitely start with there's a an information connection to the SIS systems, but that they are separate. And and I think a lot of the low hanging fruit and the easy optimization will be more on the process side. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, uh, one other question around this comes from Jeff uh, Stacy. Um, what are the standards? Uh, most important to providing data for predicting failure and maintenance. So what are the standards to uh, most important to providing data for predicting failure and maintenance? Uh, yeah, I, go ahead, Jeff. Oh, sorry. That, that's much more linked to, um, to dealing with disparate systems and data from a digital transformation perspective, you're really talking about historian data, um, maintenance data, work orders, things like that, that need, need to have good flow. Um, but then you have the issues where um, this piece of equipment is causing me serious problems in, uh, in, in failure, reductions in rates or, uh, or unexpected downtime, and it's not instrumented at all. And this is where standards-based and open applications can cost-effectively uh, uh, add instruments, pull that data into systems where operations really doesn't need it, but reliability does, uh, for example. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, another question, which I think is a good one, and, and I know I've had some end user during the ERC forum kind of commenting on it, but I'm curious what the panel thinks about the next generation system fit with the uh what they what siri refers to transitional mes's are they complementary do they integrate so any comments from the panelists uh, yeah i would like to say something uh, on this uh, because i think it's related also to the to the poll we did before when uh, the the best uh, the the most uh, voted answer was uh, digital transformation is mostly for monitoring uh, the truth is that the digital transformation uh, will bring a, let's say, new boundaries, uh, let's say, new horizons uh, to the development of control. So today, when we think about MES, we saw it as an additional layer in the automation pyramid that goes above, uh, let's say, a well-structured and some way confined real-time automation. Now, uh, 
crossing the barriers in between OT and IT, what we do is enabling a new generation of control software that doesn't have any more the boundaries of a PLC or of a DCS. So the next generation of MES actually will become an extension of automation of, co of, of control out of the boundaries of the, of the floor level and so on. So uh, I think that uh, uh, most of the innovations that we are going to see in the next few years will actually happen in uh, what traditional was considered the MES layer of the pyramid. Yeah, uh, almost like a, a data hub where you grab the extra data that you need that doesn't come from the traditional DCS and, and leverage it. Thank you, Bridget and Franco. Now, question from Sam Tiara. Uh, I had the pleasure of talking to him last week. He says, I'm not fully convinced that, that fully decoupling the uh, vendor hardware to open software would be an easy task. Too much invested with vendors, but I hope this uh, time uh, industry can make progressive leaps and achieve this. Uh, go on to talk about uh, work on a major automation vendor like 61131 coming to being. I guess the one question, why should the industrial automation vendors ever give up their proprietary business model? Ask Xerox what is happening and is that uh, a, a breakthrough innovation wave is arriving. So what we are seeing is that we have accumulated technologies in the past few years uh, that together can bring a new business model. And John was highlighting that before. So uh, if you don't change, uh, most probably you are going to die in market terms or become irrelevant. Because what is coming in a way is a wave of, uh, as I was saying, breakthrough innovation, where it will change the business model. The new value will not be anymore in selling boxes. Obviously, boxes will continue to be sold, as we see laptops, uh, desktops, PCs, servers being sold. But the real added value will be in software, will be in, in new functionalities, in data analytics, in artificial intelligence. And this requires new business models. So those that will adapt first, most probably will become the leader of the next generation of automation. Thank you for that, Franco. Uh, question for John came from uh, uh, Sana Papa. Uh, Please do, uh, do you see future and more softer solution on subscription, including hardware? Or it's kind of like going to the comparison between uh, Xerox per print model, for example. Any comments on that? Well, it's, um, I mean, I think, it, yes, the future is moving in that direction. But having said that, we're, we're also a very conservative industry, right? So. Um, so, so we talk about machine as a service, this sort of thing. It's going to take, it's going to take a few years. I think it will increase. How high will it get? I don't know. I don't have my crystal ball in front of me. Um, but I would just emphasize it. Clearly, there'll be a shift in value from, as Franco said, boxes, hardware, to software, but also services. Okay. There's definitely going to be a shift in value. Now, how far it will go and how quick, we, we will see. Uh, but it's definitely happening now. Uh. Got it. Any, uh, maybe I'll do a quick round robin. One, one word of advice for, for the audience. We, we got a slew of them, the questions, but we know for sure we're not going to get to each one of them. So maybe just a quick round robin. One word of advice uh, for uh, anybody in the audience that's looking to get started in this digital transformation. Maybe in 20 seconds or less, what would that be? For my side, I would say, go Google, I, go, go learn more about IEC 61499 and come and talk to us if you want to know more about it. We'll be very happy to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, John, Bridget? Um, you know, I think really it's a question of people looking at where they have pain and where they think they have opportunity and, and start to put a case together for that. And then quickly, one of the other questions, you know, asked if the portability was possible and it, and it works, it's real. <laughs> Had to throw that out. Great. Uh, Jeffrey? Yep. Um, look into more around um, abst abstraction of software from hardware and that layer of, of independence and think about the working relationship of people in the plant. You have technicians that are basically hardware based and replacing equipment uh, as they go versus uh, the software layer that you would like to be insulated for some of those daily 
maintenance activities that are basically replacing parts and things like that where your control is always intact and and future proof to some uh, to a large extent thank you jeffrey and, and franco well uh, i will uh, my words goes to the to the guys that are gonna uh, start university quite soon and it is uh, select uh, industrial automation and do it in the those universities that look into the future because in the next 10 15 years our sector will see a completely new uh, generation of things to do and uh, and that is where actually something uh, interesting is going to happen and i would say one of the jobs of, of the future got it uh, thank you for that thank you the panelists maybe maybe any, any questions that i didn't ask that i should be asking anybody wants to jump in and comment All right, well, if uh, I just want to thank you, the panelists, Bridget, Franco, John, Jeffrey, uh, for, for uh, insightful uh, presentation, panel discussion. And thank you to sponsor Schneider Electric for, uh, uh, for sponsoring this track and stay tuned for other uh, sessions uh, throughout the rest of the day. Thank you for uh, supporting the event for those of you that participate. Thank you.